pere, 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 Hello, one and all. Welcome back to the Crap Cafe. I'm your host, Soge Trent, and today, in light of some recent developments in both the anime and the manga, I'd like to take some time to examine the one and only backup captain for the Straw Hat Pirates, God Usa. His strengths, his weaknesses, and the path I believe he will follow in order to overcome his end of series matchup, Blackbeard's own personal orbital targeting system, Van Auger. At a glance, this fight seems like an absolute stomp, especially when considering Van Auger's brand new Warp Warp Fruit abilities that now allow him to teleport seemingly anywhere within his field of vision, and as he was already capable of seeing and hitting targets from several miles away, this fruit essentially gives him almost complete freedom of mobility, making this double fruit the perfect addition to his moveset and fighting style covering any potential downsides that his long-range tactics could potentially encounter. Which unfortunately means that with this new power, the world's potentially greatest sniper is now able to teleport within range of his target, which could still be well over an island away, shoot said target from their blind spot, then warp again to a safe location, all before he can ever be located or identified. If he doesn't eliminate the target on the first go-round, he can simply pop back again, and repeat the process, which arguably makes Van Auger one of the biggest threats among all of Blackbeard's crew. But what about our lord and savior, God Usopp? At face value, this matchup sets us up for a future battle between Usopp and Auger, in which Usopp will be tasked to hit an unpredictable teleporting assassin, with nothing but a slingshot, all before the assassin, who is also a world-class marksman, mind you, is able to hit Usopp with a single shot in return. And while Usopp has certainly pulled some amazing things out of his mask throughout the series, this fight might still be too much for our young Sniper King. But Usopp is a smart cookie who, unlike his captain, is actually aware of the members of his competition, at the very least simply because they may one day pose a threat to his own safety. So I say all this because Usopp likely knows of Augur's existence in the One Piece world. And from what we've seen in his few moments of free time, in between existential crises and goofing around with Luffy, Usopp spends his free time upgrading and developing his weapon arsenal. So if Usopp, in his infinite wisdom, has foreseen a potential battle against Augur, what might an Usopp with prep time be able to accomplish? So sit back, relax, and get ready for my theory as to exactly how prepped Usopp will triumph over Van Auger, and how his iconic weapon will be the deciding factor in this destined battle. So with Van Auger's abilities mostly explained, let's begin by taking a look at Usopp's skill set and his main weapon of choice. As if we can establish Usopp's skill set, it'll make it a lot easier to understand the areas in which his growth will be focused. Overall, Usopp's main skill set can be broken down into three categories. His aim and long-range weaponry. His speed and agility, which allow him to use hit-and-run tactics. His intellect and trickery, allowing him to grow to incorporate new technologies and abilities, as well as use them to cleverly outsmart and subdue his opponents. These skills, in addition to his main weapon of choice, the slingshot, allow Usopp to be a versatile and dangerous fighter, despite his track record throughout the story. For the first chunk of the series, Usopp uses his ever-handy slingshot, known as the Ginga Pachinko, a generic slingshot likely gifted to him by his parents that he would play with and use to ease his boredom on the island. Over time, either due to his dedication, natural talent, or potentially even his natural iron sight, his nose, Usopp eventually developed into a formidable marksman before ever leaving the island, and then continued to develop during his adventures with the Straw Hats until he was capable of challenging a man by the name of Big Daddy Masterson to a duel in Logue Town and coming out the victor. But I know some of you may be thinking, isn't he from a filler episode? And while yes, he is from a filler section of the series, he was actually designed and created by Oda, but was cut from Logue Town in the manga due to some time restraints as Oda was looking to enter the Grand Line and close the prologue of the story by chapter 100. And I know Big Daddy isn't the most intimidating name, but he was actually one of the most famous sharpshooters within all of the East Blue, only ever losing to Usopp's father, Yasop, the marksman of the red-haired pirates. 
So by the time Usopp and the Straw Hats entered the Grand Line, he was already the greatest sniper in all of the East Blue, putting him on an equal playing field with all of the other members of the Straw Hats, who at the time they entered the Grand Line were also the greatest navigator, cook, competitive eater, and swordsman of their piece of the sea. But a world-class sharpshooter can only go so far with standard equipment, so Usopp decided to create a new version of his worn-out slingshot that was worthy of his newfound skills. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly when Usopp forged this new creation, but presumably at some point while he was cooking up in his factory on board the Mary, the first form of the Kabuto was born. I say we don't know exactly when this weapon was forged, because we're never actually shown its creation. In fact, it might actually be one of the few plot holes within all of the series. But personally, my headcanon is that it was created just after Skypea and before Water 7. You see, the Kabuto was first revealed when Usopp simply pulls it out from Hammer Space on the rooftop of the gate to Annie's lobby, sometime after his transformation into Soge King on board the Sea Train. But when you take into consideration that he was only on the Sea Train because he'd been kidnapped, and he was also kept tied up for the majority of his time spent there, this must mean that he had already crafted the weapon sometime before this point, and was simply unveiling it for the first time upon its first appearance in the story. So starting at the sea train and working backwards, let's figure out exactly when it must have been crafted. Before going on the sea train, Usopp did spend some time in Frankie's hideout, when he was kidnapped for the first time that evening by Frankie and his men. And while this would be the perfect time for Usopp to have crafted the Kabuto, we do see a lot of his actions there, and for the most part, he seems entirely focused on the state of the Mary, and otherwise his time there was interrupted when CP9 came a-knocking. But then the only time in Water 7 that Usopp could possibly have made the weapon would be just before his fight with Luffy, while he was preparing for their duel. But I don't think this is where it was crafted either. Why make a weapon for a fight and not use it? But that sentiment is a double-edged sword, as if it were created prior to their fight, why wouldn't he have used it to battle Luffy? Well, I think there's actually a, a pretty easy answer to that. Remember, after Usopp and Luffy's argument, things escalated fairly quickly, and Usopp stormed off the ship taking little with him. It's likely that the newly formed Kamuto was left behind. And Usopp certainly has way too much pride to go and ask the Straw Hats to give it back, just so that he can use it to do better in a fight against their captain. So, if seemingly it wasn't during any part of Water 7, where could the Kabuto have been made? Well, I think the answer to this question can be answered pretty simply once you consider what drove Luffy to create his second and third gears. See, during the events of Long Ring Long Land, the arc just after Skypea but before Water 7, Aokiji, one of the three admirals on all of the marines, half-heartedly assaulted the Straw Hat pirates in his attempt to capture Nico Robin, and even though he was using less than half of his strength, he easily dealt with the entire crew, leaving Robin and Luffy completely frozen, Zoro and Sanji wounded, and the whole crew in disarray. This humbling moment left every member of the crew questioning their strength. So, of course, after this event, I believe they both spent a little time in the workshop in a desperate attempt to better themselves before the next island. And like Usopp, Luffy waited until almost the exact same moment halfway through the Water 7 and Innie's Lobby Saga before busting out his new gears. So let me know in the comments if you agree with my hypothesis for when it was created or if you think it was just a plot hole. So moving past its unclear origins, the Kaputo is a new and improved version of Usopp's Ginga Pachinko, sporting a longer handle with increased stability, allowing him to set it on the ground to improve his aim, as well as a new 5-point frame with additional anchor points, giving him increased range and better accuracy. This weapon also incorporates the dial technology acquired from his time in Skypea. Usopp is able to do things such as using breath dials to increase the spin of his projectiles, making them shoot even faster, using flame dials to increase the potency of his fire stars, and, and so on. These upgrades are what leveled Usopp up from the East Blue's best sharpshooter into one of the best sharpshooters on all of the Grand Line allowing him to consistently rain down blows on his opponents from the top of the Tower of Justice, well over a mile away from his targets. In fact, his incredible abilities were the deciding factor in Robin's rescue from CP9, as Usopp allowed the key to be delivered to Robin long after she would have otherwise been out of reach for the rest of the crew. And after Innie's lobby, Usopp would go on to use this weapon throughout the remainder of the pre-time skip until the crew was broken apart and he was presented with the need to develop yet again. 
This development would come not only from the addition of the pop greens from the Boyne Archipelago into his arsenal, but also in the form of additional upgrades to his Kabuto. This latest form of the weapon bolsters a new black finish with the same five point frame. However, the standard form of the black Kabuto has a much shorter handle, just longer than the original Ginga Pachinko. This shorter handle represents the mid range form of the tool allowing for quicker, successive shots at the cost of some range. But don't let the small size fool you. This Kabuto has been outfitted with the botanical advancements that Usopp made in the Boing Archipelago, allowing for it to enter its grow-up black Kabuto form and even the super grow-up form. By simply adding a little bit of water to the black Kabuto, it will absorb it and use it to grow into its larger grow-up form. The grown-up black Kabuto is rarely seen, but this form of the weapon mimics the extended handle of the original Kabuto, but bolsters much higher damage potential and ammo capacity. In this form and above, Usopp gains access to the chomping grass that lives inside of his weapon. Yes, that's right, Usopp's weapon is actually alive. In fact, in this mode, Usopp can feed any kind of rubble and debris into the mouth of the plant and use it to shoot devastating maelstorms of whatever he chooses to load, skyrocketing directly into his enemies. This means he never has to worry about running out of ammo ever again. He can just find whatever is lying around and turn it into a terrifying weapon. But the grow-up form is not the only transformation the Black Kabuto has access to. You see, by giving the weapon a much, much larger amount of water, it is able to grow much, much larger getting so big that it towers over Usopp, making it virtually impossible to move, essentially meaning that while this form probably wins hands down in highest damage output, it loses outright in mobility, basically turning Usopp's slingshot into a mounted ballista. But with this form, in combination with its other forms, the Black Kabuto definitely sits at the top of the list for Usopp's best weapons. Well, for now at least, because Usopp has upgraded his weapon whenever he has gained access to new technologies. This is exactly what he did after Skypea when he incorporated the dials into both Nami's Climb Attack and his own Kabuto. And then again after he had spent some time in the Boyan Archipelago and gained access to the Pop Green. So now that the crew is on Egghead, the island of the future, and the home to Dr. Vekapunk, the greatest scientist in the Grand Line, how might Usopp upgrade his favorite weapon to prepare for the end game of the series. Given that Usopp got his dial upgrades from the Skypeans and the pop green from Boyne, it's safe to say that we can expect him to incorporate the namesake technology of the places he goes into his own arsenal, especially when that technology could improve his chances of survival. So if there's one thing that Egghead or Vegapunk would be known for, I think it's safe to say that it would be their advancements in the field of Devil Fruit technology. Specifically, the ability to give devil fruits to inanimate objects. Not only has the entire Egghead arc thus far largely revolved around the Seraphim and Pacifista, artificial beings with the powers of already existing fruits, but looking back into the story, Usopp was actually present for the first ever mention of Vegapunk's technology. According to Miss Merry Christmas, Lawsu, Mr. Four's dog cannon ab abomination is a product of the Grand Line's advancements in the field of devil fruit technology allowing inanimate objects like guns and swords to gain the power of devil fruits. We've met several of these creations throughout the story, such as Funk Freed, Spandam's pet sword. Interestingly enough, this is the exact same arc where Usopp's Kabuto was first revealed, and additionally, Spandam, Funk Freed's owner, is the only member of CP9 that Usopp can claim to have defeated, giving him yet another direct link to Vegapunk's devil fruit advancements. Which brings us to the present day in the story, where he and the Straw Hats have arrived on Vegapunk's very own island, finally giving him access to the man with the know-how on merging weapons and devil fruits. But in all fairness, unlike a, a sword or a gun, the Black Kabuto is not only alive, but its grow-up form has an actual mouth. So even without Vegapunk's direct assistance, I don't think Usopp would have a very hard time figuring out that process all on his own and Egghead should also present relatively easy access to Devil Fruits. Think about it. If Vegapunk has been studying the secrets of Devil Fruits all this time, he must have a stockpile of them somewhere on the island. So, if Usopp was presented with the option of feeding his Black Kabuto basically any fruit of his liking, 
what fruit would be best suited for him going forward in the story, and more specifically, his potential in-game deathmatch against Van Auger. While it would be completely fine to simply speculate on how a battle between the two would play out and what fruit would best counter Van Auger's abilities, I think it's best to first establish the limits of Vegapunk's Devil Fruit technology, and then second, assess what the natural progression of Usopp's techniques could potentially evolve into, by examining a couple of his previous battles. So let's begin with Vegapunk's technology. The only items with Devil Fruits that we've seen in the story have all had zone fruits. This includes other inanimate objects with Devil Fruits like Otama's Tanuki Teapot, Bunbuku, as well as the non-canon Canon Llama, Al Pacchino, from the Z's Ambition filler arc. It could just be a coincidence that all of these items just so happen to share the same Devil Fruit category, but much more likely, in my opinion, this is a hint from Oda that only Zone Fruits can be successfully incorporated with inanimate objects. We still can't say for sure with 100% certainty, but if zone fruits were the only fruits suited to be fed to non-sentient objects, then that wouldn't make a fair amount of sense. For example, imagine if Ace's Logia fruit, the Marimara no Mi, was fed to a sword like Funkfreet. While it would be dope to have a fire sword, I don't think the sword would be capable of suppressing the constant burning and intangibility you gain once receiving the fruit. I mean, we saw firsthand with Ace that he had to actually work on suppressing bursting into flames. So what would be the point of a weapon that you can't even wield? The same issues pop up with Paramecia fruits as their abilities are quite the opposite and often require activation. No cannon could open up one of Law's rooms, no police box could teleport. Without a will of their own like the zone fruit, Paramecia and Logia fruits are at the very least useless as weapons. Of course, none of this matters if the zone form of the weapon renders it useless, and the blade of your brand new snake sword is just made out of snake. Thankfully, for our sake, it seems that for whatever reason, this aspect isn't an issue. When looking at all of the previous weapons with Devil Fruits in the series, it appears that no matter the weapon, it manages to maintain its basic form and function. Funkfried, for example, is still able to cut in its hybrid form, even though that would otherwise be a part of the element's trunk. The same can be said of Lasso. While he still has a mouth and a face, he is fully capable of firing baseballs once he opens his mouth. So, this would suggest that no matter the fruit, the Black Kabuta would retain its function as a slingshot. So now we're left with only a single Devil Fruit category to choose from, but that's not really a bother, as I think a zone fruit would actually be one of the most fitting options for Usopp. You see, when it comes to Usopp, his fights largely revolve around his long-distance attacks, and his tendency to use hit-and-run tactics, which is largely driven by his natural cowardice. That they can easily be split into two categories based around the same hit-and-run strategies, mounted and unmounted combat. The first group are his standard on-foot hit-and-run battles. This includes fights like Usopp vs. Chu, his duel against Luffy, and his battle against Perona. For as much as Usopp wishes he could be a brave warrior, his combat philosophy seems more rooted in the basic tenets of self-defense, run to safety and avoid all conflict. In the battles in this category, Usopp spends a large amount of his time fleeing from his opponents, using his speed and endurance to try to create distance. Once distance, Usopp can try to either hide to confuse his enemy or create opportunities to set up attacks and booby traps for his unsuspecting opponent. You can take his battle with Chu from Arlong's crew, for example, where he spent most of his time sprinting away from him in the opposite direction. While mostly driven by fear, Usopp used his superior speed and endurance to keep a healthy distance and give himself time to breathe. Once he was ready, he quickly sprang into action, diving into the trees, breaking his opponent's line of sight, and then proceeding to set a clever trap using the rather basic tools he had access to at the time successfully disabling Chu long enough to clobber him repeatedly with his magnificent Usopp hammer. We even see the same playbook used against Perona, where Usopp again spends most of his time running away and trying to break her line of sight, and once again, the moment he is able to break his line of sight, he quickly turns the table on her by using his trickery and intellect. Now, let's take a look at the times where Usopp is able to use a mount in battle. While rarely seen, in these fights, Usopp is able to perform all of his usual techniques to the best of his ability. For example, in his battle against Mr. Five on Little Garden, who is a significantly stronger enemy, 
While on foot, Usopp would have been easily dealt with, but thanks to the addition of Karu, Usopp was able to maintain the relatively clear state of mind. With ample distance, Usopp was able to quickly break down his opponent's moves while constantly on the run, and most important of all, he could return fire while on the move, something that we almost never see from Usopp while he is running on foot, probably due to how hard it must be to aim any projectile while running, let alone a slingshot. So it's this addition of Karu that allowed Usopp to succeed in his objective of freeing Luffy from Miss Golden Week's control and dealing with a much tougher opponent, again through his use of trickery and intellect. And then funny enough, when the gang says goodbye to Vivi, Usopp sneaks in a little goodbye to his beloved teammate, so even he is aware of how great the combo is. In fact, in his most recent battle against Page One of the Beast Pirates, really highlights the difference between Usopp's mounted and unmounted performance. The battle between Usopp versus Page One, as well as Nami versus Ulti, begins with the two pairs battling on foot in a 2v2. This part of the battle is so one-sided that Oda could barely even show it in panel. We just cut back to see Usopp having his skull bashed in, and Nami already on the ground bleeding. Without any intervention, this easily could have been the end of the two straw hats. But thankfully, due to Otama announcing her presence on the battlefield, the weakling duo was spared. But where it really starts to get interesting is how the fight proceeds after the two climb aboard Komachio, Tama's pet and best friend. Once on board, the two are able to keep their distance from the Tobiropo siblings and start forming a plan. And it doesn't take long before Usopp is able to begin to fully unleash his new arsenal for the first time in all the post time skip, dropping bomb after bomb on page one while he does his best to keep up with the pair. This constant drain of having to chase Usopp and dodge all of his odd yet powerful attacks is too much for any enemy to handle, and page one would eventually fall as well until finally being finished off by a single blow from Big Mom, after Usopp had softened him up, of course. And now that I've mentioned Big Mom, I want to start getting into the meat of the final aspect of our theory. You see, Big Mom is a part of a small subset of characters who have been overlooked by the One Piece power scaling community. Sort of like how swordsmen and Kenpo experts exist in the series, there exists a group of rarely seen mounted warriors. This list includes people such as Gonfall from Skypea, Big Mom with the help of her homies, and even Blackbeard's own Doc Hewan Stronger. These fighters are at their best with the aid of their partners whom they ride. Big Mom, for example, was a significant threat during her battle on the rooftop specifically because of her homies and her mobility. By using Zeus, she could hover stationary in the air, easily able to rain down lightning on all of the supernova striking them out of the sky one by one, leaving her completely inaccessible to anyone without the ability to fly. Without Zeus's assistance, Big Mom would have been a much easier threat to deal with. Law and Kid even recognized this as they devised a plan to separate the two long enough to knock her off the island. I think this serves as proof that Usopp's perfect upgrade would give him not only a mount and an ally to assist in his game of cat and mouse, but also giving him the same freedom of mobility as Big Mom, giving him the speed to disengage at a moment's notice or hover airborne and safely rain down blows on his opponents. And if his enemy ever did give chase, just imagine trying to catch a terrified Usopp with full 3D maneuverability. <laughs> that sounds like a nightmare task. And wouldn't you know it, Usopp has already made a weapon that currently has this exact same freedom of mobility, and literally contains a piece of Zeus within it. The exact power Big Mom has. In fact, Nami, with the help of Zeus, her newest upgrade to the Climate Act, has officially beaten Usopp to the classification of a mounted warrior, giving her the much-needed speed and mobility she needed to be as big of a threat as the rest of her crew. So will Usopp, the last member of the weakling trio, join her in this category? Obviously, I don't see Usopp hitching a ride on Zeus as well. Like I said, I think he will feed his Kabuto a double fruit. But I do think it will be one that will grant him access to full 3D maneuverability. And just to clarify, when I say full 3D maneuverability, I mean the ability to not only fly, but to hover and move around in any fashion he likes. Think of the difference between a falcon and a hummingbird. While the falcon is an expert flyer, the hummingbird can move through the air as it pleases in a full 360 degree field. 
So with that said, what sort of animal devil fruit would be a fitting match for Usopp and his Kabuto? Well, to start, there's actually not many members of the animal kingdom that are able to access a full 360 degree field of motion in the air. But to narrow our list all the way down to just a few options, I think the best thing to do is to look at the true meaning behind in the actual Japanese translation of the word kabuto. Many Japanese readers, or at least fans that are familiar with Japanese culture and wildlife, may be aware that the kabuto is actually named after the species of Japanese black rhino beetles, or in Japan, kabutomushi. This species of beetle is native exclusively to Japan, and is best known for the pointed protrusions at the end of its horn. Look familiar? Well, this is the exact same pattern that's in Usopp's own kabuto and black kabuto. Furthermore, Usopp, who is notably not Japanese, is only aware of this fact because he himself is a lifelong entomology enthusiast. Back in Surat Village, when he wasn't practicing his sniping or terrorizing the locals, Usopp would gather up bugs and spiders and make them fight. In fact, insects are the only thing in the One Piece world that Usopp doesn't seem to be afraid of. Think way back to Jaya. When Nami and Sanji freaked out and ran away from the various insects and spiders lurking all around them, Usopp somehow stood stone-faced in front of what I consider to be absolute evil. To further tie Usopp to insects, we can also look at Heracleson, his master during the time skip, who actually dresses up as a Hercules beetle, bringing the concept of Usopp and beetles even closer together. So is this what Oda has slowly been hinting towards? A post-egghead Usopp feeding the Mushi Mushi no Mi model Black Kabuto Mushi to his own Black Kabuto? Giving him the complete freedom and mobility that he needs to perfectly complete his fighting style? Allowing him to freely fire from the horn of the weapon as it flies him wherever he pleases? Well, yes and no. More astute members of the One Piece fandom may be aware that not only does the Black Kabuto Mushi fruit actually exist in the series, but Rather unfortunately for this theory, it has already been eaten by a character in the series. An ally of the Straw Hats no less. The leader of the Yellow Kabu squad and member of the 5th division of the Straw Hat fleet. Kabu of the Tantata Pirates. So, do I think Oda is gonna kill this character off to give Usopp his fruit? Well, no, of course not. It, it's Oda. Kabu's gonna live a long life. But trust me, as much as I would love if Usopp were to just toss Kabu into the mouth of the Black Kabuto so that my theory could line up, I believe that there is actually another, much better option. One that would not only give Usopp a symbolic tie to his longtime heroes and masters, the Giants, who also just so happened to make an appearance in Egghead, but also to a figure in Greek myth known for bringing light to the world. I believe that sometime between Egghead and Elbeth, Usopp's Black Kabuto will be receiving the Mushi Mushi no Mi model Atlas. The Atlas beetle is a giant among beetles, and one of the most sought after in the world of entomology. It has a massive size and impressive strength that truly makes it worthy of sharing the name of Atlas. If you are unfamiliar with the name of Atlas, or Greek myths in general, let me quickly fill you in. In the Greek mythos, long before the time that Zeus and the pantheon of Greek gods we are all familiar with ruled the world, it was the age of the Titans, giants who ruled the lands and controlled the world. It was only after Zeus cut his siblings out from his father's belly that they rose up to overthrow their reign and replace them as the new rulers of the earth. Atlas was one of these Titans and was known as the strongest of all. After the gods' uprising, Atlas was punished and forced to carry the entire world on his shoulders. You may have even seen him in this pose before. And one day, during this endless torture, Atlas was turned to stone by the head of Medusa. And interestingly enough, in Egghead, Usopp, an ally of the giants in One Piece, was just petrified and turned to stone by a snake, mirroring the story of Atlas. Additionally, Atlas is the brother of Prometheus, a trickster god of fire. In the myth of Prometheus, he pulls a prank on Zeus, and as punishment, Zeus withholds fire from the realm of humanity. 
However, after Prometheus discovers this, he feels terrible, and in a desperate plea to make things right with humanity, he decides to sneak into the realm of the gods and to steal a handful of their fire to give back to humanity, essentially bringing forth a new dawn to the world. So, with a single fruit, we could possibly connect Usopp to the giants he strives to be like, to Luffy, his brother in arms, and the bringer of the dawn, and his lifelong interest in entomology. It really doesn't get better than this for a One Piece theorist. But we aren't done yet, because just what kind of abilities would this Atlas Kabuto have? I previously stated that with the addition of a zone devil fruit, an inanimate object still retains the ability to serve its original purpose. A gun can shoot, a knife can cut, and a teapot can still pour. So with the atlas fruit, the pointed Y-frame would likely still be located at the end of the beetle's horn, giving it the appearance of the actual Kabutomushi, and also giving Usopp the ability to freely fire from its horn as it zips him around. But the black Kabuto can do more than just shoot. In fact, the Black Kabuto has three forms that it can switch between. I think there's a very good chance that the Atlas Kabuto could still grow when water is applied. This would bypass any concerns about the Atlas Kabuto's potential size and form, and allow it to gigantify at will, in making Atlas an even more fitting name. All with the additional bonus of speed, defense, increased firing power, and most importantly, the power of flight. So now that we know what fruit Usopp should add to his arsenal, why exactly do I believe that it's exactly what Usopp will need to defeat Van Auger? After all, how is the ability to move quickly and fly going to allow him to shoot a teleporting assassin? Well, beloved viewer, the answer to that lies in the natural misconception of readers when they first pictured this battle. You see, when we first learned of Augur's new power, the very first thought that went through everyone's head was, wow, how is Usopp going to hit him now? And we pictured a, a dope battle in which Usopp will be tasked to hit an unpredictable teleporting assassin who is always moving out of range, all before the teleporting assassin is able to hit him in a single shot in return. However, in reality, Usopp's not a fighter. He never has been. This fight won't be the destined duel between two rival sniper kings that we keep hyping it up to be. Like every fight Usopp has ever had, if he encounters an enemy that he doesn't think he can beat, he'll run. You see, Oda didn't give Van Auger the Warp Warp Fruit ability because he needs to run away from Usopp. No, he has the Warp Warp Fruit ability because it might be the only thing in this world that would allow him to keep up with Usopp. When you consider that even normally while he's on foot, catching up to a frightened Usopp is nearly impossible, this battle isn't going to go down as Usopp chasing down Van Auger. It's going to be Van Auger hopping around after Usopp while he desperately tries to think of a way to escape or form a counterattack. Currently in the story, this may still be too much for Usopp. If he slips up even once, he may be taken down by Auger. However, with the addition of the Mushi Mushi no Mi model atlas, Usopp has a hell of a lot more chance of staying just outside of Augur's line of fire, long enough to either set up a trap or predict his movements, potentially using his own expert sniping abilities to force Augur to teleport to a specific location to get the angle he needs to take his next shot. And then, and only then, Usopp could fire a successful counterattack. Of course, we can't 100% prove this theory, but doesn't Usopp's final battle in the series being the ultimate game of cat and mouse actually sound really awesome? Just imagine a fight where Usopp not only has to hit the perfect shot on an impossible target, but also has to use every bit of his intellect and bag of tricks to put together a perfect plan on the fly, turning his cowardice and tendency to flee into a weapon that might just become his biggest strength. So please, if you've watched all the way through and you enjoyed my theory, please hit that like button below. And whether or not you agree with my theory about Usopp's progression in the series, please tell me what you think in the comments, and feel free to share your ideas. And if you enjoyed this video, you'll probably like some of my other content, like the secret backstories of Don Krieg and Captain Kuro. But that's all I've got for now, and thank you for coming to the Crab Cafe. Uh, yeah.